High energy physics is in a bit of an awkward spot right now. The standard model of particle physics has incredible predictive power, but we know that there has to be more to physics. Things like observations of dark matter and baryon asymmetry, as well as the lack of connection between gravity and quantum mechanics, tell us that new physics has to come in somewhere. The issue is, the, the standard model seems more or less complete. Outside of the questionable anomalies here or there, the standard model agrees with experiment. So where do we go from here? The good news is that not all is lost. There is one place where we know for sure that the standard model is, in fact, incomplete, and it has to do with the unassuming particle known as the neutrino. Specifically, in the standard model, the neutrino is massless, but we know from experiment that neutrinos must be massive due to a mechanism known as neutrino oscillation. Now, the concept of neutrino oscillations is somewhat simple, but the details are a bit more difficult. So if we want to truly understand neutrino oscillations, we have to talk about a few things first. So this video is going to be structured as follows. First, we have to talk about what neutrinos are and how they interact with other particles of the standard model. Then, we'll discuss why neutrinos don't have mass in the standard model. Finally, we'll talk about neutrino oscillations and how we know that they do have mass in reality, and how it tells us that the standard model is incomplete. Okay, so what is a neutrino? In particle physics speak, a neutrino is a neutral lepton. Lepton meaning that it is a fermion, which does not interact with the strong force, and neutral meaning that it doesn't carry electric charge. There are three different types of neutrinos, called flavors, each corresponding to a different charged lepton. The electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino, where the muon and tau are basically just heavier versions of the electron. We'll get back to why this sort of pairing is important in a bit. So, if neutrinos don't interact with the strong force, they don't interact with the electromagnetic force, and gravity isn't a part of the standard model, how can they actually interact with anything to be detectable? Well, there is one more fundamental interaction, known as the weak interaction, that neutrinos do talk to. The specifics of this interaction are a bit tricky and could fill up several graduate level lectures on their own, but the two important things to know are that it is an incredibly short range force, and it is the only interaction that we know of that can actually change particle type. The consequence of the former is that it's very rare to have two particles interact via the weak force, meaning that neutrinos are very difficult to detect. The consequence of the latter is that the weak interaction allows for particle decay, where a heavy particle can decay into lighter particles. The most common of these is beta decay, where a neutron in an atom is turned into a proton, emitting an electron and an electron antineutrino. Other examples of weak interaction mediated decays are pions decaying into muons and muon antineutrinos, or muons decaying into electrons, muon neutrinos, and electron antineutrinos. If you notice, in all of these examples, the neutrinos are always paired up with their corresponding charged leptons in the decay. This is, in fact, how neutrinos of a particular flavor are detected. Say a neutrino flies into a detector and finds a neutron in an atom. Then, the weak interaction can change the neutrino into an electron and the neutron into a proton. Since we detect an electron in the end state, we know that the neutrino that came in had to be an electron neutrino. If we detect a muon in the final state, then the neutrino must be a muon neutrino. This is exactly what experiments like Super Kamiokande, Nova, and Dune look for. They don't try to find the neutrino itself, but instead the charged lepton associated with its weak interaction. Okay, so now that we know what neutrinos are and how they interact, we can ask why they don't have a mass in the standard model. When dealing with standard model fermions, most of the time we can split them up into two different pieces. We call these two pieces right-handed and left-handed, where the names are just related to how these pieces change under Lorentz transformations. Now, while the strong and electromagnetic forces couldn't care less about the handedness of fermions, it turns out that the weak interaction actually has a preference towards left-handed fermions. Because of this preference, and the fact that neutrinos only talk to the weak interaction, only left-handed neutrinos have been observed. This doesn't mean that right-handed neutrinos can't exist, just that we haven't seen them yet, but we'll get back to that later. 
This is important because of the fact that most of the time, fermions need both a left-handed and a right-handed component to have a mass in order to not violate the symmetries of the standard model. The type of mass which requires both right and left-handed pieces is known as a Dirac mass. However, neutrinos are a bit special because they're neutral under both the strong and electromagnetic forces, which are directly tied to these standard model symmetries. So it's actually possible to include a mass for only left-handed neutrinos, known as a Majorana mass, but it can't be done with the standard model alone. So either way of adding a mass to the neutrino requires physics beyond the standard model, either a right-handed neutrino that hasn't been observed that allows a Dirac mass, or some new physics which generates a Majorana mass, or both. Now that we know why neutrinos don't have mass in the standard model, we can talk about neutrino oscillations and why they tell us that neutrinos actually do have mass in reality. This all has to do with the fact that neutrinos, which appear in interactions, the electron, muon, and tau neutrinos, are not actually the same neutrinos which propagate through spacetime. This just comes from the fact that, to actually evolve a system through time to allow it to propagate, the system must be in a definite energy state. So all this means is that these flavor states cannot be assigned a definite energy. To resolve this, we write them as a linear combination, or scaled sum, of definite energy states, called nu1, nu2, and nu3. This may seem like a wild thing to do, but it isn't actually that abnormal. Think of it this way. If I have some set of axes that I'm using to describe a vector, call them x and y, I can instead choose to describe the same vector in terms of different axes, x prime and y prime, which are related to the original axes by a linear combination. We're doing the exact same thing with the neutrino states, except instead of x and y, we might have nu e and nu mu, and instead of x prime and y prime, we might have nu 1 and nu 2, and the vector just represents the physical particle we're describing. Nothing is actually changing about this vector, the only thing that's changing is how we're choosing to describe it. To get a concrete example of how this plays out, let's just work with a very simple case where we only have two neutrinos, nu e and nu mu, as flavor or interaction states, and nu 1 and nu 2 as definite energy states. So say the neutrino is in some state psi of t, which is a function of time. In general, psi can be a linear combination of either nu e and nu mu, or nu1 and nu2, but not both at the same time. For the time being, we want to look at how psi of t evolves with time, so we care about the definite energy states. What we really want to look at is the amplitude of finding the neutrino in the state nu1 or nu2 after a time t. These amplitudes will be complex numbers, so we can represent them by arrows in their respective complex planes. So how do these arrows evolve with time? Well, the rules of quantum mechanics, namely the Schrodinger equation, tells us that the lengths of these arrows will not change, and they'll only rotate in the complex plane. Without diving into too much detail, the relevant frequency of this rotation will be given by the square of the mass of either nu1 or nu2. So the amplitude of finding the state psi in state nu1 will in general rotate at a different rate than the amplitude of finding it in state nu2. Now, how do we test if the neutrinos are massive? As we've already said, we observe neutrinos through their flavor states, not their definite energy states. So how does this help us? Say we have a process which we know produces electron neutrinos, like fusion in the core of the sun. The neutrino will begin in a definite flavor state, so that psi of zero is equal to nu e. But the state is, in general, a linear combination of nu1 and nu2. For simplicity, we'll just take it to be 1 over root 2 times nu1 plus nu2. Now, as the neutrino propagates, it will evolve away from the state nu e to some general state psi of t. If we set up an experiment to detect specifically electron neutrinos, then the amplitude of measuring an electron neutrino after it has propagated is given by a sum of the amplitudes to measure the neutrino in either definite energy state. This amplitude will again be a complex number, which is a sum of two other complex numbers. As we've seen, any complex number can be represented as an arrow in the complex plane, so 
we take the arrows corresponding to the amplitude of finding psi t in either state nu1 or nu2, attach them tip to tail, and this new amplitude will be given by the arrow connecting the tail of the first arrow to the tip of the second. The probability of detecting an electron neutrino is given by the length of this arrow. But remember, the amplitude of finding psi in either definite energy state rotates in the complex plane, where the frequency of rotation is given by the mass squared of the state. Now, if the masses of the two definite energy states are equal, the probability of finding an electron neutrino never changes. This, of course, includes the case where both of the neutrinos are massless. However, if the two masses are different, this probability actually changes. This means that even if we know for a fact that electron neutrinos are produced at point A, when we measure them at point B, they may no longer be electron neutrinos. This is, in fact, what was observed originally in the late 1960s, where the rate of observations of electron neutrinos was noticeably lower than the expected rate of electron neutrinos produced at the core of the sun during nuclear fusion. Many other experiments, such as Super Kamiokande and Daya Bay, have since confirmed that neutrinos do in fact oscillate, meaning that not only they must have mass, but the different definite energy neutrino states all have different masses. So we know that neutrinos have mass, but they don't in the standard model. So there has to be some new physics to explain this, either by introducing a right-handed neutrino, by allowing some unknown interaction to generate a Majorana mass, or a combination of both. The problem is that it's very difficult to discover any of these situations. Due to the weak interaction's preference for left-handed particles, it turns out that a right-handed neutrino just wouldn't interact with any of the standard model forces. As for a left-handed Majorana neutrino, processes where Majorana effects can be observed, like neutrinoless double beta decay, are incredibly rare and difficult to observe. Nevertheless, the search for a source of the neutrino mass continues with several current and future experiments looking for any signals they can find which might point towards a solution. At the end of the day, neutrinos are incredibly interesting particles to study because we know that there must be some source of new physics beyond the standard model living in them.